family, it's time to pray. And we're going to look ultimately at Psalm 33 on today as we continue our study on the notion of hope. Remember that we've been using as a base text Romans 15 and verse number four, where there the Bible says the things that were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scripture might have hope. And we've been looking back over the Old Testament to grab a hold of a definition and a functional way to appreciate the concept of hope. And so far we've learned that for the disciple, hope is the undeniable expectation and giddy anticipation of the move of God despite one's physical consequences, despite one's emotional turbulence, and despite the physical attack that's going on around the context of the believer. For the disciple, Hope is directly correlated to the person of God, executed by the power of God, and one's resolve is connected to the nature of God. We believe that hope includes trust, belief, and obedience despite one's situatedness and because of their relationship with God. We've learned not only in addition to this definition about how hope ought to be appreciated, but we've gone a little bit further from the definition and grabbed a hold of the notion that hope is not based on the outcome, but hope is based on the object. But we, we went a little bit further than that. Once you appreciate the notion that hope is not based on the outcome, but the object, it helps you and I to appreciate a second aspect of it, that we need to learn how to practice hope regardless of what's going on around us. And the practice of hope is directly correlated to having the right paradigm. And we appreciate that when you and I practice living out a posture of hope, that that posture, again, is based on knowing that hope is not contingent on the outcome. It's all on the object, and the object is God. 
when you get the posture based on the object, then that helps you, number two, to appreciate that the more I know about the person of God, the more my resolve will be established. When I know the person of God, then I already know that I won't be moved by the outcome or the things that go on around me. But then, in addition to me knowing the posture is based on the object, God. But that person, God, is more than just power. He's more than just what he does. But God is, in fact, a person. As I know the person, God, then I'm able to establish, number three, the correct paradigm. My paradigm is colored by, it is shaped by, it is built by me knowing the person of God. So the disciple's paradigm secures my understanding of having hope. But my paradigm is shaped by whatever I know about God. Now remember this. Whatever you think about God, whatever comes to your mind when God is spoken in your spirit, that, that shiver, that, that, uh, that, that audacious kind of reverence and respect about the nature of God is what ought to be what gives you a concrete, unmovable foundation on hope. Hear me again on this. You cannot allow culture to shake your understanding and your hope that comes from the nature of God. Remember, we looked at Isaiah chapter 8, verses 12 through 17. You cannot allow close relationships, doesn't matter who they are, your children, your spouse, your mother, your father, your 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 uh, any relationship you have, you cannot allow any close relationship to move you away from your concrete faith and expectation that God is going to move, Micah chapter 7. But you also can't even allow your own inner spirit, your own inner emotion, Emotional turbulence to cause you to be moved away from the nature of your God. Psalm 42. But see, in addition to knowing that your paradigm, practicing hope, is shaped on your paradigm, which is built on you knowing the person of God. And the person of God is what allows you to know that I am uh, content on the object, God, rather than the outcome. If I know that God is in control, and I know God, and I know the nature of my God. God. It will shape my paradigm for how I navigate through this thing we call life. Now, in addition to this, watch what we're going to see. In addition to appreciating that in order for you and I to practice having the right kind of paradigm, in order for me to practice hope, it comes out of my paradigm. And my paradigm is shaped not only by me knowing God, but my paradigm, additional aspect of my paradigm, is appreciating the nature of my God. I not only need to know that there is a God and that, that God is person, but when I when I dig a little deeper, I need to know the nature of the person of who my God is. And Psalm 33 is going to help us to appreciate another aspect of the nature of your God. I want you to turn over there with me real quickly. Psalm 33. And when you look at Psalm 33, I want you to go back and read all of it. Go back when you get a chance and read all 22 verses. But I want for just a moment to put our focus on verses 18 through 22. And then I'm going to go back over and rehearse a number of things out of this text. But listen to Psalm 33, verse 18 through 22. The text says, But the eyes of the Lord, are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love, to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. This, this psalm again reminds us of an additional aspect of how our paradigm is enriched. Our paradigm is enriched by appreciating, write this down, the gracious nature of our God. Go back up again. Notice that when I start practicing a hope, I'm practicing hope because it's shaped by a paradigm that says that I know my posture is built on the, the object, not the outcome, God. And when I know that, that, that the object is my God, I appreciate that God is more than power. He's a person. But when I appreciate God as person, that then will color how I see everything else. Now, my paradigm then.
in takes on even more girth when I understand the nature of my God. And when I appreciate the nature of my God. One of the things I need to know about my God is that God by nature is good. God by nature is gracious. God by nature is loving. God by nature is kind. God by nature is my creator and the one who will sustain me. Let me say it again. When you know the nature of your God, you immediately know by nature what God will not allow. Oh, I said something right there. When you know by nature who your God is and you know his nature, you know by nature what God will not allow to happen to the creature. Now in this psalm, go back and read it. Because in this psalm, you'll notice in the first five verses that he describes God as the creator. Just go back and read it. He'll describe God as, as being the one who's in control, or, or describes God's character rather, who's being one who is right and faithful and true and righteous. Verse number five in particular, the Lord loves righteousness and justice, and the earth is filled or full of his unfailing love. Look at the character right at the beginning. He's righteous, he's true, but right at the beginning, he has unfailing love. God, by nature, is love. You can hear 1 John talk about how God is love. You can hear the scripture over and over again describe the loving nature of your God. Think about Lamentations chapter 3. Oh, I know you know that text. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Notice what you learn about your God. He is faithful. He is loving. He is steadfast. He is kind. God, when he made his creature, made his creature out of the nature of who he is, which is why God loves you like he does. It doesn't make sense that he would love somebody as from a broken and frail and messed up as we are. And yet God, who made us a little lower than the angels, Psalm 8, who made us a little lower than the angels, still has ridiculous, unfailing, unmatched, indescribable love for the creature. So the first five verses, the psalmist describes God and, and his character. And his character is that he has unfailing love. But then from, from the next few verses, verses 6 through about verse number 12, you see God as the creator. And as God, as the creator, he will say that he spoke a thing and it came into existence. Everything about the world is made by God's nature. But then watch, God not only is characteristically a God of love, and by nature he is, he is your creator. A creator who has power to just speak a thing and it comes into existence. But a third thing here in the text is that God is contemplative over the creature. Hear me on this, please, if you don't get nothing else. Remember this about your God. God is always watching everything that goes on around you. Never ever believe that a God who is so powerful, a God that made everything by just speaking it into existence, a God who transcends, who's everywhere at the same time. He's in the past, in your present, in the future, at the same time. He's outside of the universe, holding everything together. He made everything by just speaking it. A thought that brought into existence by his very word. That's the kind of power that he has. He's in control of every heartbeat, every breath you take, every molecule that makes up the oxygen, everything else, every hair on every head that's ever existed. He knows it. Every star that's in the horizon, he knows them. Every granule of sand, God made it. Every atom that makes up everything that is, God designed it. God is even in, involved in the subatomic elements that make up our reality. That's your God. And that God who made everything, who's outside of everything, who holds it all together by his word. That, But that same God is the same God who from heaven, verse 13, looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place, he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. God is contemplatively your creator, your God who characteristically is love and righteous and powerful. That God in his character as your creator 
contemplatively looks over your life. He sees you when you cry. He sees you when you walk the floor. He sees you in your up moments. He sees you when you got plenty of money. He sees you when you're happy. He sees you when you dance around your house. He sees you when you sing all by yourself. He sees your praise moments. He sees your prayer moments. He sees you in the pandemic. He sees you dealing with all of the governmental issues. He sees you struggling over what you're struggling over. He sees your worry. He sees your hurt. God sees you. He contemplatively watches everything that makes you who you are. He knows everything you go through. He understands your fears for your children. He understands your question about your future. He understands whether or not you can lift your head up out of shame. He knows everything that makes you who you are. Your God, as great as he is, cares enough to look down on your life. Never forget that your God is directly involved looking at and watching over even right now in this prayer devotional. He's sitting beside you, looking you in your face and wondering whether or not you will continue to know that he cares for you. That's your God. But watch the psalmist go a step further and help us to appreciate the nature of our God. We not only see him in his character and his creative ability and his contemplative nature. But then the fourth element is that we see the compassionate nature of our God. That's 18 through 22. 18 through 22 describes the fact that his eyes are on those who fear him. Watch whose hope is in his unfailing love. What's he going to do? Deliver them from death. Keep them alive in famine. Wait. We wait on him who is our shield. We wait on him and, and he is our hope. Do you see it? Over and over again, this God that we rely on, this God cares for us. And watch what I'm arguing here. Very simply, you and I need to remember that as I practice living in hope, I practice living in hope knowing that something in the moment has to be connected to the vantage point of the character of the one who in control. You got to see this. How something looks in the moment must be connected to the vantage point of the character of the one who's in control. What you go through, the way you can continue to have hope in what you go through, the way you can continue to have hope in what you deal with is, is because it's connected not to your vantage point, not to your perspective, not to your paradigm, but in the eyes and from the vantage point of the one who's in control in his character. My vantage point over my life is not based on Thomas's fair, frail, and faulty, and fickle, and finite kind of perspective. I need someone who sees further than I see, who sees beyond what I see, who can see beyond my tears, beyond my fears, beyond my issues. I need a God who can always say, I see the end just like I see the beginning. I know you're going through struggle. I know you've got issue, but my, my name is at stake. And because I am God talking, because I am a good God, because I am a loving God, because I am a just God, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will never allow this thing to turn out into be anything other than good. Why God? Because God is good. So the outcome must be good. Now watch how something looks in the moment. Must be connected to the vantage point and the character of the one who's in control. You can remember for Noah, the ark looked dark, but it was a tool for deliverance. For Abraham, Mount Moriah looked bleak, but it was a transition for a blessing. For Israel, the Red Sea looked final, but it was a path for their future. For Joseph, the prison looked like it was permanent, but it was a part of God's process. For Jesus, the cross look like it was death, but it was a vehicle for deliverance. What the disciple must learn is that our perspective and our paradigm about the context that we're in is shaped not only by our personal concrete faith, but by the character of the God who's in control of the context. And as long as we know characteristically that God intrinsically is good, then our 
situation must be all good. God cannot move outside of his character. So what I'm going through, watch it now, it's all good because God is good. What I'm feeling, ultimately, it's all good because God is good. What I endure, ultimately, it's all good because God is good. Some sort of way, all of what we deal with, though it may be intended by the creature and the culture and your friends and your family, it might be intended by them to be bad. When God gets a hold of it, it's all good. Some sort of way, the weather and the tides of life may be aimed at your destruction, but God is working in a way where it's all working out for my good. So what am I going to do? I'm going to keep on loving my God. I'm going to keep on trusting my God. I'm going to keep on waiting for my God. I'm going to keep on hoping for my God. I'm never going to stop loving my God because I know that even when they meant it for evil, God meant it for good. Are y'all seeing the picture when you and I anchor in and hold on to the nature of our God? Watch what we're saying. My paradigm is shaped by the nature of my God and the person of my God. We've already seen the person. I'm holding on to the object, not the outcome. But when I hold on to the object, God, as a person, when I look deeper at his person, I see God is characteristically loving and faithful and true. I see God is my creator. I see God is considerate of who I am. And I see God is compassionate about my life. And since I know that about my God, I do exactly what the text says. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our shield. He is our help. In him, our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Watch the point. Continue to hope in God and have a paradigm that's shaped by his person and a paradigm that's shaped by his nature. Can we talk to God? Father, we love you. We thank you. We bless you and honor you for being our God. We magnify your name because you are an awesome God. We ask, oh God, that you bless us to continue to hope in you, trust in you, wait on you, and reside in you. Lord, we love you and honor you for being our God. Thank you for being true. Thank you for being near. Thank you for being always present and always powerful in our context. God, we ask that you bless our mind and our hope to be centered on you. We pray, Father God, that as we go through the different issues of our day, as we deal with the turbulence, as we deal with the emotional situations, as we deal with the physical consequences that are going on around us, we ask that you bless us to have an anchored sensibility and a hope in you. We pray, Father God, that you shape our paradigm to be enamored by the person of who you are so that we can get lost in the fact that we trust in the object of our hope, never the outcome of what goes on. And because you are our God, we know that by nature of who you are, whatever we deal with will be all good because you are all good. So Lord, we pray that you bless us to have Genesis 50 and verse number 20 kind of faith. A faith that says, Lord, even if the world meant it for evil, we know that you meant that thing for good. Help us, Lord God, to have a Romans 8 kind of sensibility where we realize that all things are working together for our good because we love you and because we are anchored in you are and who you are. And Lord, we pray that you help us to love you back, love you relentlessly, love you fearlessly, love you, Lord God, tenaciously, love you in a way where we come after you with every fiber of our being and we never stop, we never give up, we never relent, but we pursue you wholeheartedly and with everything that we are. We ask in this season that you continue to heal, strengthen, and renew, that you help us, Father, to live every moment just for you because of who you are and because of your namesake. And we will be mindful and careful to give you all the glory, all the praise, and all the honor. Lord, we love you, we honor you, we bless you, and in the name of Jesus. We together say, we together pray, amen and amen. Listen, continue to reach out to your God and remember to have hope. We hold on without any shadow of a doubt that hope is the undeniable expectation and dare I say giddy anticipation of the move of God. God is moving in your life despite 
the physical consequences despite the emotional turbulence and in spite of the spiritual attack that may be going on all around you. Remember, disciple of God, that your hope is directly correlated to the person of God. It's executed by the power of God and your resolve is connected to the nature of your God. And one thing you know about his nature is that he is faithful. He is true. He is good. And since he is faithful, true and good, you can trust in the object of your hope and not worry about the outcome. Listen, I'm going to pray for you. I'm asking you, please pray for me and let's watch our God change everything around us. God bless you and God keep you. I'm thankful that you love me. I'm thankful. I'm